Sveiki, su jumis po netrumpos pertraukos Vilniaus universiteto istorijos fakulteto podcasto Skotyli istorikai. Šiandienos laida kiek neįprasta, kalbėjome angliškai, nes pasikvietėme ukrainėti istorikė Tetjana Borek. Rusijai už polus Ukraina Tetjana paliko gimtai krašti ir atvyko į Vilnių. Čia gavo galimybę tęsti savo po doktorantūros tyrimą Vilniaus universiteto istorijos fakultete. Ji tyrinėjo Holodomorą, sovietų sukeltą badą Ukrainoje. Tada apie tai su jie ir pasikalbėjome. Tetjana pasakoja labai nuo sekliai, net nereikėjo užduoti klausimų. Tai tik šiandien bei ten kai ką pasitikslinant, beliko linksėti galvomis. Pradžioje uždavėme kelis klausimus iš nūdienos aktualijų. Tetjana papasako apie tai, ką veikia Ukrainoje, kur buvo prasidėjus karui, kaip keliavo į Lietuvą. Po to paklausime ir bendresnio klausimo apie tūkstantmetį Ukrainos istoriją. Tetjana gana išsamiai papasako apie pagrindinius Ukrainos valstybingumo dėmenis ir įvykius. Norint jį iš karto nerti į Holodomoro analizę, gali prasukti į maždaug 20 pokalbę minutę. Bet tikrai siūlome paklausyti visą pokalbę. Beje, fonė kartais pasigirsta lapų šiūrenimas ir krentantis pieštukai. Tai Tetjanos dukrytė atlitėjusi mamai į studiją. Pradžioje bandė kažkiek piešti, bet didesnė laiko dalį ramiai ir įdėmiai žiūrėjo mamą, matyt galvodama, kokia čia keista kalba ta mama kalba. Linkiu įdomaus pokalbę. Hi Tatiana, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Uh, first of all, can I ask about your personal and academic uh, background? Where were you born? Uh, where you studied and worked and how did you end up in Lithuania? Mm-hmm. So thank you for inviting me. My name is Tatiana Borek. Uh, right before the war, I was on my second year of postdoc studies, which means that I was doing my second PhD. Uh, well, doctorate in Ukraine, we have two PhDs. Um, I just lived ordinary life, was was taking care of my family, was doing research. Uh, then when the war began, I spent five nights uh, almost not sleeping. The last fifth night, an order came to turn off the lights at night so that an enemy could not target you. And uh, then they began to bomb Kharkiv. And at that point, I realized that I will not survive the next night, sitting like this with no sleep, with no light for almost 10 hours. Uh, and also, I was really scared for my kids. Uh, so I took a decision to to cross the border. At that point, I had no idea where I was going to. I just wanted to cross the border to have my kids, my two kids, in a in safe place. Uh, I, as I spent these five nights uh, in a village close to Kiev, the capital where my parents live. I'm from Kiev. Um, and so I go to, to the capital, to the railroad station, and this was something you might see in the movies uh, about the war when there are crowds of people, no schedule because the trains just were coming and leaving. So I was lucky uh, to caught a train which just came and I was close to it. So we were even sitting. We got to Ternopil, which is city in Western Ukraine. Um, there we spent one night at volunteers um, who gave their apartments for people like us like going westwards. Then we got train to Lviv, which is on the border with Poland. There I took a bus to the border, uh, says, said bye to my husband who assisted me uh, on this uh, uh, refugee trip. So we crossed the border by feet. Uh, and while going to Poland, my brother gave me, and my brother is a lawyer in Kiev, so he got email from his colleagues in Europe, lawyers who gave their contacts, uh, offering help for uh, refugees with kids. So he sent me this list. I looked at it. I saw Lithuania, and something inside me said, I will go there. <laughs> I don't know why, just... Lithuania. So I contacted a volunteer who is a director of a law firm here in Vilnius. <coughs> uh, she even managed to call the bus <laughs> from who took me for, from uh, Przemysl, which is in Poland, close to the Polish-Ukrainian border. 
and uh, I ended up in uh, Vilnius and uh, I got in contact with the history department at Vilnius University and they offered an, uh, a scholarship for me, a kind of half position, half scholarship. Then also the European Union created a fund for, um, for Ukrainian uh, scholars who had to escape. So at this point I'm trying to restore my to renew my my research again and uh, I'm happy that my kids are safe and uh, and trying to to contribute through my research and through some talks about uh, Ukrainian history um, here in in Vilnius and you uh, worked at a university in Kiev? Uh, well, before the, I have two kids, so I was I was sitting with them. I had a kind of break in my <laughs> in my yeah. in my teaching at uh, uh, high educational institution. Uh, so I left from um, yeah from, uh, from this position. Uh, well, postdoc, uh, it, it it does not imply teaching right now since I have to present my uh, my dissertation and its topic is the the Holodomor, which mm-hmm. is the artificial famine in in Ukraine. And exactly, I'm um, working on oral history, and oral history is a type of historical documents that that differ from official documents that we can find in the archives. Uh, official documents that were produced by uh, authorities like organs of, of power and they have their own vision because the docu- official documents in a totalitarian state that's, that's something you might uh, know how to work with and how to extract information you need and you often do not have information you need because obviously the state uh, was trying to to erase the traces, while oral history uh, is uh, um, is a type of historical documents that um, appear as a result of interviewing of survivors, and it's widely used now in many spheres, in many topics, in many countries. And the same in Ukraine, we have th- ten thousands of interviews written down from survivors, and they offer a real incredible. Um, amount of of testimonies that help us to understand how it, it took place because from the official documents you do not have this picture you get it exactly from oral sources so that's what i'm yeah. doing well we will uh, dive deep into the history of holodomor uh, in a second but uh, before uh, i just wanted to ask you a broader question uh, vladimir Putin, from his imperialist uh, perspective, uh, in several of his speeches, uh, said that uh, Ukraine was, uh, as a state, was created by the Bolsheviks and that the Ukrainian nation does not exist. Uh, absolute bullshit. But uh, also, he, w- we can see uh, several years uh, now uh, the um, uh, attempts to present the history of Kiev and Rus as uh, not a Ukrainian history, but as a Russian history. Uh, I know uh, it is not easy to uh, abstract uh, history of thousand years into a few mm-hmm. sentences, but I will could try. you b- <laughs> briefly outline the main events of Ukrainian statehood uh, for our listeners who are not very knowledgeable in Ukrainian history? Uh, yes, I will try to, to, to be brief, which is which is really a challenge. Uh, so, um, the, the, my main point is that uh, Ukrainian history uh, was absolutely normal according to uh, if you look at uh, our neighbors it had this this type of history according to every period so we had Kievan Rus that was created by uh, uh, Hihar or Volodymyr or Oleg but it was end of the of the ten, um, of the 10th century uh, it was this its center was Kiev uh, and um, at the same time, well, Moscow state, uh, it has its own principality, but it was it it, it was northern, uh, so, uh, with with other capital. It was Novgorod, and then the, its center was Moscow. But it was later. So in in Ukraine, we had this Kievan Rus that lasted from uh, uh, end of 10th century till mid of uh, 13th. Uh, 14th, I'm sorry, century when um, when Tatars came and 
interrupted uh, a tradition of statehood. Then uh, our tradition of statehood passed westward. It was principality of, Hal uh, of Halic and Volin. So it was basically a continuation of Kievan Rus tradition. It had nothing to do with Moscow that was on the east, uh, with, with Tatars, that was based on its contact with uh, uh, Zolota Arda, which was a state uh, created by the Tatars who invaded from uh, the east. Uh, then from uh, mid of uh, uh, 14th century, uh, Lithuanian uh, state would begin to, to be created and uh, uh, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and you might not know that its full name was a Grand Duchy of Lithuania, Rus and Gemaitia. So it even included Rus. Um, then Ukrainian lands, uh, especially during Lithuanian uh, Prince Olgert, they became part of uh, your state, of Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Amazingly enough, uh, a law codex, which is uh, Lithuanian metrica, as we call it in Ukraine, it uh, was valid till the beginning of the 20th century on Ukrainian lands. So we had this, this tradition of belonging to a European tradition in terms of law, uh, Rus language was one of the official languages of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. As you might know, and records management was also done in, in Rus language. While Moscow was uh, had its own uh, problems in conquering its neighbors. It was in the process of making its, its statehood. It has nothing to do with, with Kiev at that time. Um, then, uh, uh, as you know, f uh, 1569, uh, Lithuania and Poland united in Rzecz Pospolita. Uh, at that same time, even a bit earlier, on Ukrainian lands, uh, uh, Cossacks appeared. You might hear about them. These were, since Ukrainian land was a borderland, again, as it is now, between East and West. So, uh, Cossacks appeared as people who wanted to, didn't, didn't want uh, uh, to live under the rule. They wanted to defend this East, wild East, you might call it. Well, part of Cossacks became part of the uh, Polish army. And they demanded uh, some privileges for them. At some point, uh, well, Polish kings, they gave these privileges. At some point, they didn't. And in the middle of the uh, 17th century, uh, Ukrainian uh, liberation war, you might call it, whatever, uh, began. That was headed by Hetman Bogdan Khmelnytsky. Uh, and the reason was that the, the Polish king uh, at the time denied some privileges that Cossacks demanded. So that war broke out. And initially, obviously, it, it did not start as the war for creation of Ukrainian statehood. But in the process, well, gradually, Bogdan Khmelnytsky, uh, he came up that he might create this kind of state, and he created the state. It was called it was called Hetmanate, that existed till almost well officially till the end of 18th century. So it's kind of 200 of years of statehood that had a traditions that uh, remembered um, a traditions of Kiev and Rus. I mean, mentally, not obviously, but mentally, uh, of being part of Grand Duchy of Lithuania. And if you look at, at documents that were, historical documents that were produced at that time, they mentioned this, this period, they included this period of being part of, of Lithuanian state, of, of Kiev and Rus, as, into their historical narratives, which means that they saw themselves as one nation with, with that part of history. Again, it had nothing to do with, with more Moscow state right now. But then uh, uh, international situation was very difficult because there were Poles on the north, uh, uh, Moscow state to the east and Tatars on the, west, uh, on the south from Crimea. And uh, they, uh, Bogdan Khmelnytsky, like other hetmans, he was trying to set uh, various types of coalitions uh, with this or with that, then war, then someone won, someone lost. Again, new, new type of coalition. Everyone was trying to 
uh, uh, to do according its its own national, let's say, interest, as we now say. And at some point, Bogdan Khmelnytsky came to an idea that it would be better for him to have uh, Moscow Tsar as his ally. So in 1654, he uh, he signed um, this Pereyaslav Treaty that turned out to be uh, uh, to be something absolutely different he treated because um, in in his system of uh, outlook it was just uh, a temporary agreement uh, ask for help in his war against uh, Poles and Tatars but uh, according to, to Russian traditions, to Moscovite uh, then Russian tradition, it meant that uh, he signs uh, uh, that by signing this treaty, uh, he uh, he entered the, the Russian state. And that was that basic, uh, basic difference that actually lasts even even now, you, you might see this. So for him, it was just a temporary step. But for the Russian state, it was inclusion of these lands. And uh, uh, from this point on, uh, the struggle between Ukraine and, and Russia began. There were various treaties, many hetmans, uh, wins, and, and uh, some lost wars, some, some victories. But uh, then we had uh, Hetman Ivan Mazepa. Uh, here we come to another important uh, important date, which is 1709, which is uh, Poltava battle. Um, so the, the, the Russian army the, uh, uh, under, under Peter the Great, they were struggling also having all these kinds of wars and fights with its neighbors. And uh, Ukrainian hetman Ivan Mazepa, uh, who was a lie of Peter the Great, of Peter initially, uh, of Russian uh, uh, Tsar at that point. Um, and then Ivan Mazepa realized that actually it's better for him to try to, to create independent, as we would say, uh, uh, Ukraine. So he made an agreement with the Swedish king, who also had its own interest. And then there was this battle, uh, Poltava battle, that uh, uh, Ukrainians and uh, Swedish lost. And this meant a turn in the whole European history, because from this point the Russian Empire began to be built. Uh, so, uh, and Ukrainian lands began to be incorporated into the Russian Empire that was uh, proclaimed in 1729, uh, uh, 21, 10 years after the Poltava battle. Um, in 1710, in exile, uh, an, an assistant of Ivan Mazepa, Polyp Orlik, uh, wrote a constitution that uh, obviously could not influence all these events, but uh, but mentally it was very important because it's often called the first European constitution. It it suggested a division of power into three branches, as we know it now, judicial, executive, and legislative. Uh, it was uh, it was a kind of this uh, agreement be be uh, between the authorities and the people. What kind of responsibility authorities take? What kind of responsibility uh, people take? So it was very important. It uh, and again as a historical document. Uh, um, it showed this uh, the these ties with with Cossacks, with uh, Kiev and Rus, with Grand Duchy of Lithuania. So all again, it it had nothing to do mentally with the Russian Empire. Uh, then incorporation of Ukrainian lands into the Russian Empire began more and more more and more tight. 17, uh, 1775, the Zaporizhia siege was liquidated, which is a kind of symbol of complete liquidation of any signs of Ukrainian independence. It was uh, Ukrainian lands were in, in, incorporated into the Russian Empire and into Austro-Hungarian Empire after the the collapse of the Polish state after its first uh, after its uh, third division uh, Ukrainian language was banned Ukrainian uh, th theater was banned Ukrainian uh, f f like books for kids were banned all these kinds of bands and uh, uh, then se 1917 came um, you know this this year remember from your, your, your own history yeah not you personally <laughs> but you know for you uh, it meant uh, it meant uh, uh, 
a creation of Lithuanian state. Ukraine was moving the same the same direction. Uh, the kind of public government was proclaimed already in March of 1917 in Kiev. Uh, in the beginning of 1918, they proclaimed independence of Ukraine, independence from Russia, from, from everyone. It was just our first... Uh, uh, declaration of independence. But uh, the Russian state and expressed uh, the, their desire by Lenin, who said that uh, directly we will not survive without Ukrainian sugar, grain and coal. We must conquer them, otherwise we will not be able to create the, uh, what was uh, called the Soviet Union. So. Uh, in 1918, there was uh, first occupation of Ukraine by the Russian troops. In 1919, was the second occupation. Ukrainian army was fighting. There were also whites who wanted to restore the monarchy. So it was just complete, complete mess and just complete battlefield. Uh, and 1919 was a very important year in terms of Holodomor, probably I will, I will tell later. And then in 1920, it was the third invasion and uh, the army was almost one million. So you can imagine they, they had to had one million of army to conquer Ukraine. And they did it in 1921. Uh, a treaty with, with Poland was signed. In 1922, the Soviet Union was, was created and uh, Ukrainian Repu uh, Republic became it's it's part i tried to be brief <laughs> yes yeah, it's okay thank you for this uh rather in detail uh, description of the ukrainian history and obviously we we can see some similarities we can notice the same names that appear throughout lithuanian history uh, as well in the, as in, as in your narrative uh, but today we came here to talk basically about your main field of studies about Holodomor uh, and by the way if the listeners are wondering what uh, what are the noises in the background they probably can hear we have Tatiana's uh, daughter with, with us she does not have uh, any insights on Ukrainian history yet, yet. maybe <laughs> but uh, maybe in a few years we'll uh, conduct another po podcast and maybe she'll join this conversation then so the Holodomor. Uh, the translation is extermination with famine or through famine. Um, so 1922, so the Soviet Union. But you don't, it's not enough to conquer, you have to rule. <laughs> and in order to, uh, uh, to rule, this, the Soviets has um, invented such politics as routinization, which comes from the word root. In Ukraine, it was Ukrainization. It meant that in all, all national republic, it was allowed to speak in their own uh, language, to publish books, to use it elsewhere in order to root the, the, the power of it and to find the patriots. Yeah, in yeah in and then to find also the patriots who will be liquidated later. And for Ukraine, it was, uh, you, you, historians call this age, it's golden age for Ukrainian, because it was ex just explosion of everything, Ukrainian literature, Ukrainian language, Ukraine education in Ukrainian language, Ukrainian science, Edu uh, Academy of Sciences was created, all these kinds of research, Ukrainian theater, uh, it was just an explosion of everything Ukrainian. And uh, it turned out that actually Ukraine did not need this older brother. You know, it, it was okay. Uh, it, was, it, it, it turned out to be strong, to be united with, with language, with understanding of, of their past. And uh, Stalin got scared. You also must uh, remember that Ukraine was a borderland, Western borderland with Poland. And then in 1927, uh, Stalin declared politics of industrialization, which was actually politics of militarization. I prefer this term since it's more closer to truth. You know, he wanted to conquer at least Europe, he openly was talking about a socialist revolution in the whole world. So he launched this politics of militarization, but called it industrialization. In 1929, in two years, since he saw that, well, peasants were not 
reacting as he wanted the way he wanted. So in 1929, in two years, he launched this policy uh, more strict and harsher. It was forced uh, industrialization and collectivization. For peasants, it meant that they have to be uh, joined in collective farms. Because in collective farms, you don't have to buy. You just come and extract food you need to feed cities, to feed the army, and to build this military industry to conquer the world later. Uh, obviously, the peasants, especially Ukrainian peasants, they had their own vision. Unlike in, in Russia, uh, they had this общины, well, well, communities, and they had these traditions of common uh, uh, working on land. While in Ukraine, where land is just amazing, you know, you just you put a stick and something will grow out of it, as we, as we joke. So in, in, in Ukraine, Ukrainian peasants, they... Uh, did not have this tradition, they were individual farmers uh, since the liquidation of uh, in, in 19th century of uh, of slavery, let's say, yeah, uh, Kripatstva, uh, for sla- uh, yes, Sergeant, thank you. Uh, so they worked individually on land and they had, did not have any wish to to follow this politics. And if you look at the uh, amount of Ukrainians, by in 1931, it was approximately 30, 31 million of people lived in Ukraine. Of them, uh, about 85 percentages, they were peasants. So they were mostly rural population. And the majority of them were Ukrainians. Uh, so people began to resist. And in 1930, there were uh, 2,100 big organized uh, un- uh, peasant revolts in Ukraine. 4,000 only in one year. And it was a big threat. The uh, amount of participants was estimated as more than 1 million. Could could you expand a little bit on mm-hmm. these re- revolts? Uh, what does it mean a peasant re- revolt? Where did we have uh, political agendas, or they they, they were just uh, do not put us into call houses, please? Yes, that's that's very important question. Thank you. Uh, there was actually political agenda because uh, Ukrainian peasants in 1930 they uh, remembered that uh, ten years ago there was this fight for Ukraine. They they had a possibility to get their land. It was Ukrainian agenda ten years ago. Uh, they didn't hear about this commun all this kind of communist ideas that they did not have any any passion to. And uh, uh, Czechists, uh, security service and KVD, they they noticed in their reports that. Uh, during this revolt in 1930 and later, uh, before the Holodomor, obviously, Ukrainian peasants uh, sang Shenevmerla Ukraina, which is national anthem right now, and it was a kind of anthem, national song back then, uh, during the Ukrainian revolution in 1917-1921. So they, th- th- and in their uh, reports, uh, well, Czechists, they wrote like directly, like they, they recall that Ukrainian revolution, they recall Pitlura, who was leader at that time, who who, who then emigrated and was killed, well, probably by uh, an agent of NKVD in 1926 in Paris. So they knew about his murder. They recalled him. They recalled that, that period. They recalled Cossacks, you know, that like we want to have our land and do what we want to do and for some reason you sent uh some some guys who are heads of our villages for some reason who are heads of collective farms you force us there and and they just sink Shenemarla Ukraina and refuse to enter collective farms so for Stalin uh, it was obviously it has something to do with this national issue he was very obsessed with also you have to remember that in 1919 I recall this year it was very uh, difficult year for the Russian army. It was their second attempt to conquer Ukraine, and they failed. And they failed exactly because of the peasant uh, revolt. Like 1919, it was just complete 
peasant revolts in the whole Ukraine. And Stalin at that time, he was in Ukraine, he was responsible for an, uh, a minorities uh, issue. So he knew very well what was going on. He saw with his own eyes all this kind of revolts. And he remembered the results. In 1919, they failed. And now Ukraine was the, the second republic in terms of, uh, of population. It was very rich, we mentioned this, in terms of of resources and he just he, he couldn't lose uh, and ukrainian peasants resist they they leave collective farms in the first half of 1932 more than 40 uh, 40 thousand of, of uh, households in ukraine left collective farms 40 thousand you know they forced and they were just living what what should you do and uh, in the beginning of 2000s, uh, historians, first Russians and then Ukrainians, Ukrainian historians, uh, they found amazing documents that finally uh, that helps that that helps us to understand motivation of Stalin. This is actually like one document we have, but it's very important. Uh, it, well, it's set of documents. So it's correspondence of Stalin with his uh, Laika Hanovich uh, in summer of 1932. So it's very close to the beginning of the Holodomor. Summer of 1932. And Stalin expresses openly because he trusted Kaganovich. Kaganovich trusted him. So Stalin, like in other documents, he was very sincere and open. So Kaganovich was the head of Ukrainian Soviet Republic? It was back in, in 20s. Yeah, and then yeah. he was head of, uh, of Extraordinary Commission so, so he in, knew in Kuban. In Ukraine, yeah. Yes. Well, Kaganovich, yeah, he knew very well all, all this Ukrainian uh, specific so Stalin was very furious. You can you can you can see this from this document. He expressed his uh, dissatisfaction with three points. The first was uh, he said like situation in Ukraine is very bad uh, on party lines. So he meant that Ukrainian party does not obey. It has its own vision. It tries to, and he meant uh, July of 1932, just the month before, when there was a party conference in Ukraine, where Stalin was imposing big uh, a grain quotas on Ukraine. And Ukrainian Communist Party resisted because it understood that it would result into famine. And they openly uh, stated this and they resisted. So he was very furious that uh, they do not obey. They have their own vision. And he uh, expressed this in this letter. Then a uh, second point he was very angry with was uh, Soviet line, as he wrote. Uh, well, Soviet line, he meant the system of, of Soviets, Rady, uh, who were supposedly ruling, but actually they it was party who ruled, you know, and this was just a decoration. But he was dissatisfied on also with this, this decoration. He also didn't like how it was in Ukraine. It wasn't the way he wanted it to be. And the third, which is amazing, he was angry with security service. He said, they work bad. They they do not do what they have to do. I, I see what is going on in Ukraine. I don't like it. And then he said, if we do not uh, take measures, we might lose Ukraine. And in several months, we have the beginning of the Holodomor. We do not have obviously the exact date when it began and exact date when it's ended because like people were dying in spring of 32, they were dying in the beginning of 1932, in summer of 1933. But you have to distinguish between a starvation that was caused by collectivization in many regions of the USSR and between the Holodomor because there are features that make famine in Ukraine in that period, exactly, something that we actually call uh, a genocide. Why? Because um, after the collectivization began, in grain producing regions of the USSR, many many peasants, they, they met uh, starvation because of this grain quotas, all this kind of organizational things. Uh, Ukrainians also experienced this. There was famine already in 1928, uh, after the very beginning of collectivization. People were starving and dying in 1931 and 1932. But what happened in the end of 1932? And now, after having this, this correspondence of Stalin with Kaganovich, we understand. So 
we must do something in order not to lose Ukraine. And he also added that we must build um, like a model state, a model Soviet state. Um, so uh, a set of decisions was was taken and we can see it uh, from the official documents. Well, partly we see it from oral history and we uh, ca we can reconstruct what happened. So in autumn, in late autumn, in November of 1932, there were uh, several uh, decrees that allowed confiscation of potato and meat, not only grain. Like if you do not fulfill the quota, you are punished and grain is confiscated. And uh, since November, potato and meat uh, could also be confiscated. Uh, and later it was uh, not only grain, potato and meat. It was all kinds of all kind of food, of product, uh, reserves that could be found in peasant households. Uh, and this is what uh, took place in Ukraine only. Uh, like Russian colleagues, this, they say we, we have the same, but when we ask them to show us massive of oral history or documents they did not show the in in russia in russian region in russian regions well grain was confiscated in ukraine food they took food away starting from end of 1932 then what was unique for ukraine in december uh, mid-December of 1932, a decree was issued about uh, Ukrainization. And I, I've mentioned that it was very important for Ukraine and for Stalin. He understood the danger. So December 32, the decree was issued that uh, said that Ukrainization in Ukraine is hostile to the Soviet state. It's not the way we were supposed to. <laughs> We were supposed it would be organized. No, it's hostile. It's Petlurivska. Here we see tie with Simon Petlura, who was that leader of Ukrainian national movement. So for Stalin, even if it wasn't, but we can we see how Stalin uh, saw it, and and this explains the steps that were taken by him because the state was absolutely centralized. You you could not do anything, you know, on, on the top on the bottom. It was from the top to. Uh, to the bottom. So, uh, Ukrainization in Ukraine was declared hostile. It was stopped in Ukraine and in Kuban. So, n no more like you could, uh, this huge amount of everything Ukrainian in Kuban and in Ukraine. No. Uh, then we have uh, uh, we have document from uh, begin uh, from January of 1933. It ordered a blockade, uh, a transportational blockade of uh, Ukrainian SSR. So they said too many peasants are trying to escape the republic. They try to go somewhere to find food. So no more. We block the borders of Ukrainian SSR so that Ukrainians are not able to leave the Republic. The, uh, Ukrainian peasants were also banned from uh, selling tickets on trains, but actually the borders were closed, so it wouldn't help. But at least, you know, in they could move inside Ukraine, but they were also blocked. Um, As I read, uh, they had to have a special uh, decree by the call house chairman in order to get a ticket. So they, uh, they could not get into the city. Yes. No, no internal travel also. Yes. And there were no buses, no cars. Yeah. So basically, well, trains was the main means of transportation. Um, um, then... Um, we have a strange document, but now we understand. It is uh, Stalin's telegram to Ukrainian Communist Party. Uh, it's it was it was called like a congratulations with the New Year because it was uh, sent on the first of January, 1933, <coughs> and it said that uh, Ukrainian peasants must deliver grain they stole. So uh, presumably. All Ukrainian peasants were made guilty because all grain they had, they were supposed uh, to stole it from the state. So the telegram ordered Ukrainian peasants must deliver stolen grain. But Ukrainian peasants understood that if they deliver this grain, they would die. So they probably would keep this grain. And then 
it continued that if they do not a, a deliver grain, then this grain must be found. The only way to find grain, you have to enter physically into a household and to do search. And that's what became an instrument. That's how um, the Holodomor was possible, because the brigades were created in the whole Ukraine. They uh, comprised of policemen, of chickies, of uh, six, uh, about 6,000 of so-called 25,000 uh, that were sent fr- fr- from Russia, uh, representatives from uh, rayons. And they went to every peasant household and, and did searches. And during th- these uh, searches, uh, they confiscated not only grain, but whatever they could find, kidney beans, onion, peas, pumpkin, corn, uh, dried uh, fruits, uh, Whatever they could find, like poppy seeds, they confiscated everything. They also confiscated winter clothes, and winter uh, that year, according to survivors, was very uh, severe. So if you do not have winter boots and winter clothes, you are even not able to leave your house to go somewhere and try to find food. Did we confiscate or did we rob? Did, did they have an order? They did not make any any documents. Okay. So, they just so we came. Just they were allowed to, you know, uh, th- because if if they wouldn't, uh, they, they they wouldn't do this. But uh, we have information about various kinds of meetings. It was extraordinary commission in Ukraine headed by Molotov. The same commission was in Kuban, and in in Pavolja. Three commissions were created, so they have this uh, this comings to to various cities. They have this various kinds of meetings, and probably some oral instructions were obviously obviously given. Then what we have uh, we have blackboards. Uh, blackboard uh, means that uh, a, a collective farm, a person, even rayon even several rayons, which is administrative uh, uh, division in Ukraine at the time, could be set on blackboard. This uh, means that the stores in this area are closed. All goods from the stores uh, are taken out. Uh, the peasants must pay all their debts uh, they have before the state. Um, they, that they are blocked in this area, so it's kind of one more additional block for peasants to leave this area that were striking by famine. And uh, uh, there are now in Ukraine two books with this, uh, with the, the, the lists of what was put on blackboards, but it's like difficult to estimate because it's collective farms, individual, even peasants, uh, several rayons. But uh, obviously it, it seems like, you know, Ukraine, uh, according to what we see from oral history, uh, the narrative is, is the, the same. So like the whole Ukraine was a blackboard. When we asked uh, our Russian colleagues, when we had communication many years ago, like show us uh, how many blackboards did you have? They, they did not like show these numbers. They were like, we had the same, but they, they did not show us exact names of rayons, of regions that were put on that blackboard. While in Ukraine, it was widespread. So this is one more instrument to to keep peasants uh, stuck to the the, 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 the region, yes, yeah, the village. Then we have information about uh, how much uh, Turksins earned, and Turksins, Turkhivle Zenozemtsimi. This was a network of uh, stores uh, created for foreigners, and they could buy food there for. Uh, foreign currency or for gold. Obviously, peasants did not have foreign currency. So during the famine, they were allowed to go to the stores and uh, they brought uh, earrings, rings, some money they had uh, from the Russian Empire, some crosses they won during the First World War. So they came to Turksins and were able to get uh, to tra- uh, exchange their gold for uh, food. And uh, there is a statistic that in 1933, uh, in Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian network of Turksin earned 45,000 tons of gold. 
that's basically value of uh, U- Ukrainian life at, at the time. They also earned in Ukraine 25 million of rubles, uh, which was just incredible. If, if you look at uh, statistics, that was just incredible amount of money they earned for peasants who were trying to, to save their lives. Uh, then also we have uh, informational blockade about the famine. For instance, my grand-grandfather received 10 years in April of 1933. He was arrested in January uh, of 33 for saying that uh, he is starving. He got uh, 10 years of concentration camps and there are a lot of documents uh, with similar cases. For just mentioning famine in Ukraine, you you could be exiled into concentration camps. So, like, you could say that, well, we starved a little bit in the beginning of 30s, but famine in Ukraine, no, you just, you couldn't mention this. Then also, the, the, with, uh, Ukrainian historians found a, a document um, in several uh, regional archives ordering to withdraw in April of 1934, so it was one year after the famine, to withdraw the books of registry uh, where uh, people who died were registered. Uh, we have so they kind of, of tried mm-hmm. to erase the the traces. So this basically are um, are these uh, the orders and decrees that were applied only to Ukraine only. And the Holodomor uh, thus lasted from end of 1932 when the searches began. Actually, uh, survivors they point as at this uh, uh, chronological frames. For them, it was late autumn of 1932, end of 1932, beginning of 1933. So they are very exact because, you know, it's obviously a traumatic experience for them. They lost their families, their relatives, children, parents. So they obviously remember when when it began. Uh, and it lasted till May, of officially, let's say, uh, till May of 1933, because uh, in May the decree was issued that ordered uh, to stop repressions in the rural area in Ukraine. So it's a kind of official end, but obviously people continued to continued to die. So to sum up in mm-hmm. some in some extent, well, obviously collectivization was brutal no matter where it happened, and there were famines occurred in Russia and Kazakhstan. Mo- 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 in no- Kazakhstan, it's absolutely other other type of nature, but yeah, they start also. Y- mm-hmm. Yeah, but. Um, Uh, in comparison with Ukraine, it seems like uh, collectivization had an aspect of, well, basically punishment uh, for for the people that were disobeying, that uh, did not uh, follow the orders of of what Stalin imagined that everyone should follow his his ideas and just simply not only to create an economy that was controlled by the state, but where you can simply take food from the Caucasus and sell it or what do with, with whatever you want but also an asp- an aspect just of just simply punishing the, the people for simple punishment I would add it was punishment for having Ukrainian identity because simultaneously uh, Ukrainian Academy of Sciences was was defeated was destroyed uh, the processes, uh, well, the first process, Spilka Vizvolenia Ukraine, Union of Liberation of Ukraine, was um, was several years before the famine. But uh, and like academicians, like a lot of academicians, were uh, repressed. Um, in, in 1933 and 1934, there were several like uh, top party meetings in Russia, in, in Kiev, in Kharkiv, then capital in Kiev. And they said uh, openly that we combated um, Ukrainian nationalism in 1933. We combated Ukrainian nationalism in literature, in language, in culture, in theater, in science. So it was it was blow directed against Ukrainian identity, as we would say now. You know, it was it was not only about economy, and you can see these ties with with Petlura, uh, Petlurivtsi, as Ukrainians were uh, were called. Um, so, for Ukrainian historians, it's 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 more about this kind of 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 national. 
of, of national issues that were important to Stalin because he understood that before the war he might he must have th- this territory like sterile, clear, you know, obedient because he has to attack attack Polish state from from this area and they you know they they think Shen of Merle Ukraine what the hell is going on we have to do something and and he writes in his letter if if we if we do not take measures we lose Ukraine and he could not allow this and he no. i think he also knew the problem because some ukrainians were in polish state so it it uh, is uh, Uh, as as he called the negative mm-hmm. tensions from the po- uh, from Polish state from Ukrainians in Polish state and from Polish state he he was anti Polish from the 1980s 1990s yes he, he mentioned uh, Pilsudski in in this correspondence with Kaganovich like there are like h- uh, half million of uh, of supporters of Pilsudski in Ukraine so we have we have to do something he was very obsessed with this this issues we do not how again from the totalitarian documents we do not now do not know how real were his fears that ukrainians from poland might come and you know make an uprising but actually uh chickists warned him that in spring of 1933 why again this period in spring of 1933 a huge uprising has been prepared by Pulsuski supporters we do not know how real it was but in his in his mind he saw a danger and he had to do something with this and uh, it was you know exactly after the famine when um, this ukrainian identity it was decreased to just you know a- embroidery on on your clothes you know you could sing some songs you could dance hopak uh, you could wear some type of ukrainian clothes and that's it no more was allowed even posteshev uh, who participated in these repressions he was in this embroidery clothes like showing look look there is ukraine what you have ukrainian language you you have this ukrainian republic still exist but uh, it It was it was such a blow over this Ukrainian elite you know the I'm not saying even about Ukrainian peasants but uh, Ukrainian elite who also felt this this blow was repressed and you just you can name and name uh, all the, this various these names of, of people who really what who really wanted to create to build some nation some national ukrainian culture you have skripnik who committed suicide who was uh narcom of education uh, you have uh who also committed suicide in 1933 um, for probable understanding that like what is going on it just it cannot it cannot happen and probably foreseeing that they might be arrested and destroyed and And Skripnik, who really, who desperately was, uh, was he was communist, but he was pro-Ukrainian oriented, and he, as a smart, as a smart uh, person, he definitely saw what what was going on and uh, what his fate is going to be. Like Shumsky, who was a uh, narcom of education before, and he was repressed a bit later. Mm. So obviously, as you mentioned, the Communist Party tried to hide its trails, tried to hide the famine. Uh, but what are the current estimates and most probable estimates of the uh, amount of people that perished during mm-hmm. the, the famine in Ukraine? We have these numbers thanks to Ukrainian demographers. Before 2014, they were lucky to get into the Russian uh, archives. Uh, and uh, and get some official documents so um, according to their estimation this is minimal amount they they could estimate uh, the amount of debt is uh, 3.9 million 3.9 million uh, so this is not amount of uh, of all people who died it's a kind of extra mortality level as they explain it because obviously like well people would die you know any anyway even without the famine so they took this average average level of mortality and what extra 
they got this number, 3.9 million, which is a direct losses. And they also extend uh, it to the year of 1934, when still uh, well, people were still weak, affected, you know, yeah. and uh, they were still dying. So they see this extra mortality level, 3.9 million uh, direct losses and indirect uh, 600,000, which means that this is amount of children that were who were not born because they their uh, kind of parents, they, 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 they died. So miscarriages and so on. This is called indirect losses. So together we have 4.5 4. million and its peak was approximately six months, uh, half of the year from the end of 1931. The majority of, of deaths took place in spring and summer of 1933 uh, when people were uh, uh, running out of uh, food reserves. Uh, I would also like to uh, tell a little bit about uh, what it looked like. So uh, being a peasant in, in in that time in Ukrainian village meant that you were searched like people with no documents with guns they were just broken into your your houses they were like destroying everything they could beat you they could torture you uh, they could arrest uh, uh, you for some reason um, you couldn't just go somewhere to buy food you didn't have money you couldn't go because you were blocked from going either from your village or you couldn't get to a city because there were also blocks there you couldn't get out of the republic For, uh, you observed a swallowing and starvation of your kids and being a kid you couldn't understand why are you are you hungry uh, for many parents they they took a decision to, to take their kids to the villages, uh, to the cities and leave them there in hope that they would end up in an orphanage and they would survive. And we have many stories of kids who will say, like, we recall that our parents like took us to a city and left us there and I haven't seen my, my parents anymore. Um, you, uh, there was absolutely uh, horrible stories uh, about about burial because uh, well, people were too weak to make individual, you know, like burial, like digging uh, individual graves. So these were mass graves, um, and well, bodies were just uh, thrown there without coffin because people were too weak to, to main coffins initially. There were some coffins, but, but then they were just like bodies with no clothes because often clothes was traded for food, was exchanged for food. Um, like like many bodies in these mass graves, there was no rituals that was very important for Ukrainians as uh, as, as nation, you know, who had uh, a Christianity as, as religion. Uh, no, no rituals, just uh, throwing bodies. And many survivors uh, say that we even do not know where is uh, a grave of our uh, our parents. Well, cases of cannibalism, obviously, uh, this is something that, uh, for obvious reason, Ukrainian historians and researchers do not do, uh, do research at all. What we know, we know that in the archive of uh, Ministry of Interior of Ukraine, there are like several thousand probably of criminal cases opened for uh, this, th these cases. Um, we know from uh, oral history that um, uh, when these people were caught, usually police took them. And sometimes people say that they were just just killed with, 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 with no traces, with, with no court. Um, we, we have uh, a testimony from a survivor who ended up in the West after the Second World War, Saman Pidhaini. He wrote, he was um, exiled to Solovki camp, concentration camp, and so he wrote in his memoirs after the war that in that Solovki camp there were more than 300 of cannibals from Ukraine. Uh, what amazes me uh, regarding this issue is that when people... Uh, survivors uh, describe this page, these events, they do not accuse. And that's something that uh, amazes because they say, like, in neutral voice, like, 
they are just uh, described and sometimes they say they were not guilty because it was the state that, you know, took all food of them and people just lose their mind. So that's something that, you know, took place in, in 1930s in the heart of Europe. Um, that's something that was done uh, intendantly, artificially by by the state. Just to add on that, well, when we think about the ex- extremities of it, totalitarian <coughs> regimes, we usually, we usually tend to think about or imagine the life in concentration camps, or either Nazi uh, cam- camps or the Soviet Gulag. But in this case, we can see that there was... There was plenty of horrific things that happened outside the camps and there was the, the totalitarian regimes managed to just destroy people without any camps or without any rest. And not spending any money. What yeah. What is amazing, you know, Mr. Putin is now spending a lot of money on missiles and, uh, and bombs. But Mr. <coughs> Stalin was too smart. He just blocked the republic. He even and confiscated problem. confiscated food, you know, and yeah, Atarsins earned a lot of a lot of money, uh, and this is, uh, you know, many survivors. Um, uh, they tried to send letters to their relatives on the west. And there was a campaign in the West uh, when people tried to attract attention. They were trying to say, look, what is going on right now? But we know that the Soviet Union was in the process of of recognition. The United States wanted to to recognize it officially and set contacts like many other countries. So, uh, like the world uh, pretended that it it didn't hear. And there was and there were several journalists, Western journalists, like Gareth Jones, uh, for instance, uh, and he died in the mid of, of 30s in Mongolia with under very strange conditions. So probably he was also killed for exactly for telling the truth. He was too brave. He traveled in, in Ukraine and, and, and he wrote about this and we have these articles. Uh, but the world uh, didn't hear. Then uh, after the war, when many... Uh, many hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians uh, uh, refused to return to the USSR from the the, the camps in in Germany, uh, as uh, Osterbeiters, where they were sent, or many escaped uh, from the the Soviet Union uh, uh, after the war, or or, or during the, the end of the war, they refused to go. They were also also publishing their narratives, and they were trying to to say what was going on, but again, the world uh, didn't hear. But what is amazing for me as a historian who is working with with the testimonies that that narrative is the same. You might take uh, testimonies from 1930s, from beginning of 1950s, 1980s, 2000s, but people describe the same, you know, uh, geographical names are different, well, well, names of activists are different, but, but core narrative, uh, how they started, how, what was the beginning, this, this, the searches, uh, deprival of food, how they started, how they desperately tried to, to, to elaborate, elaborate some strategies for survival. Uh, that's uh, uh, they uh, almost all all recall these cases of swallowing, of of starvation, of of this burial that was was so shocking, you know, for people. As I was mentioning, in, in mass graves with with no rituals, no like even individual coffin, people were denied even the right to be buried, you know, in a separate grave. And how many? Um, how many hundreds of thousands just died on the roads, you know, like trying to get somewhere to to find food and they do not have graves at all. And how was it important already in the, in the end of 1980s, uh, officially, in 1987, uh, Sherbitsky, who was the first secretary of uh, Ukrainian Communist Party, he confessed finally <laughs> that the famine in Ukraine took place, and it was a kind of uh, official sign that okay, you can you can talk about this. And what kind of explosion of of memories in newspapers, on radio, uh, not on TV at the time; it was later. But uh, well, people wanted to share their stories. 
Taurus. Uh, even in 2000s, uh, a colleague of mine, a philologist from Lugansk, she organized a field trip to collect uh, information as a folklorist about her field, like songs, etc. And she began to interview people and they were like, no, no, we will tell you about the famine. And they started, you know, <laughs> she was, well, but probably, no, no, listen, listen, I want to tell you. So even in 2000s, uh, Uh, people had this this feeling that listen we won't finally we want to tell you what happened and there is one testimony you know I worked with like many many thousands of them uh, and there is also a map uh, in at Harvard University um, that is available online it's called MAPA and, and there are also testimonies in in that uh, database and on the map uh, you can ch- you can explore so I read through many many thousands of, of testimonies but one testimony I, I recall it it was a man and he said when the, the the famine began and all these things began to I was a boy I didn't understand what was going on I just remember I was hungry and then he said at some point my mom told me like sit and listen uh, we um, we are being killed uh, I don't know why we did not do anything I don't know, but you know, they kill us with famine, we, we do not have food. So if you survive, if we die, and if you survive, I want you to keep the memory about what happened. And then when it will be possible, uh, please tell what happened. And uh, already in the end of 80s, when it, it, <coughs> it was possible to tell officially about the famine, to, to share uh, memories about what happened, he began to tell his story and then he repeated it in other newspapers, in, in, on TV. Uh, so that's, you know, and uh, oral history on the Holodomor, that's something, again, uh, it's a different story with oral history uh, on the famine in Russia because I... I wanted to to compare, but I cannot because we do not have this massive of oral history on the famine in Russia. Like the, the, those testimonies I worked with, Russian testimonies about the famine, it's uh, the narrative is absolutely different. It's like, well, collectivization began. We had read life before the collectivization, then collectivization began. We start, they confiscated grain. Then the Second World War began. You know, there, which means that they did not have this break that took place in Ukraine. When you ask about something and they, people tell, no, I, will, I want to tell you about the famine. Listen mm-hmm. to me. They didn't, ho- they didn't have this break. You know, what these measures, this, that, uh, these decisions that were taken regarding Ukraine, they did not have place in that same combination well probably like partly blockade like partly confiscation of food from someone you know from some supposedly rich peasant in Russia but it wasn't in in, in such amount that uh, people's memory in Russia uh, have these memories it doesn't have this kind of memories and horrors about uh, starvation and dying of siblings you know like like survivors a survivor might sit you know and say like my brother died then then my sister died then my parents died I remained like the only kid in in my family I was taken to an orphanage I I, I didn't see I haven't seen this kind of uh, of testimonies uh, from other Russian regions. So you might make your own conclusions <laughs> from from this. Tatiana, one final question. What would you recommend for people, English speaking, Russian speaking, or Russian mm-hmm. or English reading people mm-hmm. to read about Holodom? Uh, yes. Um, I would uh, suggest there are two two scholars. Uh, well, one is Ukrainian scholar uh, Stanislav Kulchitsky, who is doing research on the famine since the end of 1980s. And in- interestingly enough, he started as uh, a person who who was assigned to deny the, the famine, but because he was kind of Institute of History was. 
uh, was doing everything according to the party line. But when he began to do his research, he actually said, no, no, guys, that, that, that was famine. And it was something different that was uh, like famine because uh, he is an economist. Like it's something different than it was in Russia. And it has little to do with collectivization, actually. It has something, it's something different. So... Stanislav Kulchitsky, he has uh, a translations of uh, his books in Russian, uh, in English, and there are like, I don't know, like more than 10 of, of them uh, written from 2000s. And um, f- uh, another book I would uh, suggest that's a work by Anne Applebaum, who is a, a Polish uh, journalist, historian, writer. And uh, I uh, also assisted in, in, ho- in her work, so <laughs> I'm biased. <laughs> But uh, this book received uh, a lot of... Um, Um, a lot of uh, nagrada f- awards. Awards, yes. So it was uh, evaluated very high. Uh, her book came out in uh, two thousand sixteen or seventeen, and it's called Red Famine. It's also about the the Holodomor, and it includes all latest uh, archival documents. It includes also uh, oral history. Um, so I think this this two r- researchers might might help. And I'm sorry, but I have one more question, which is not related to history, but rather to the present day. I just mm-hmm. I just I've been distracted throughout uh, our conversation because I wanted to ask this question in the beginning mm-hmm. and just how are you feeling now? Right now. Well, uh, as a historian, I. Uh, I understood that before the, the, the 24th of February that he might start the war as a historian, but as, as a mother, as a Ukrainian, as a person who lives in, in the 21st century, I blocked this these thoughts and said, no, that's impossible. Well, my husband was saying from the beginning of the year, like, we have to, to take away our kids. And I was like, no, wait, wait, listen, <laughs> somehow it, it might... Well, Some something will 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 happen. Will wait? No, no, that's impossible. S- but uh, right now, as as a historian, and you, I don't know. Do you know that's very important? Actually, several days ago, an article appeared on Ria Novosti. Uh, you might find it in internet. That's basically um, the, uh, the the Russian authorities are might they might be angry right now and they did a mistake they published this uh, article that's basically instructions to solve the Ukrainian question in the 21st century so what they say directly is that Ukrainian nation does not exist Ukrainian state does, does not exist we have to liquidate everything Ukrainian in Ukraine we have to do de-ukrainization Remember, I was telling about Ukrainization in the beginning of the 20th century. Now they say we have to de-Ukrainize Ukraine again. Uh, all people in Ukraine are guilty because they support these Nazi authorities. We, so we have to denazificate them as well. And only when we de-Ukrainize whole Ukraine and denazificate the whole Ukraine, then the peace will come. Uh, th- th- uh, this was published on official web page Ria Novosti. You cannot publish there anything that uh, was not approved by the authorities. So that's basically their vision and their continuation of their struggle with with Ukraine. Like they began in you know 1654. <laughs> Officially, they they tried to solve Ukraine question during the Holodomor with the help of the Holodomor, uh, but they they failed. So now that their I hope that their final attempt to solve the Ukrainian question. And amazingly enough, when the war began, I was shocked by uh, how Ukrainians reacted to this it seems like all the i was very skeptical about before the war about the the narrative about like like memories that comes from from past but you know i realized that it looks like this memory about all these types of repressions that took place 
by the totalitarian regime in the 20th century, you know, somehow got to mind of, of, of Ukrainians because they, from the first day of wars, they were so fierce, they, and they wrote that they want to kill us. It's, it's not about Donbass as they cover it, you know, it's, it has nothing to do with Donbass and Crimea. They want to kill us as Ukrainians, they want to liquidate Ukrainian state. And several days ago, we saw this article where they directly state that they want to liquidate us as a nation and as a state. And obviously, you understand that if they win, uh, all neighbors will, will be next because they will come to you and say, look, guys, 30 years ago, you were a part of our state. We want now you to return back. Time's up. That's actually what they say now. Okay, return to us and we'll stop bombing you. But we understand that they w will make concentration camp, but just in, in, on the whole territory of Ukraine. They, For uh, Mr. Putin and Russian elite, existence of Ukraine is something they cannot, cannot handle, starting from... 1654 and then from 1999 to 1991. And uh, I am really proud of the West who has finally realized the threat. We were warning about this from 2014. Uh, I'm very proud of our Zbrojny Sile Ukraine, our militaries, you know, our, uh, our people who uh, hit uh, Russian Russian planes from armament that is not supposed to, to do, you know, like Western experts say, no, it's impossible. It's supposed, it's, you, you're you supposed to hit tanks, not something that flies. And, you know, my, my citizens, they, they, they do this. And, and, and that's something amazing. And what they have done to civilian population Uh, now we have this liberated uh, small towns, uh, Irpin, Bucha, now Baradyanka, which is even worse, is in Bucha. That uh, is uh, that represents their intention. They want us and the whole Europe to be scared, you know, to say, okay, guys, let's we we confess that we do not have any law right now. We confess that we have only. Uh, only power. So the biggest the state, the more the more rights it have, and the smaller the state is, then it has nothing to do. It it does not have to exist. And actually, I I was listening to some Russian uh, guys on TVs. This 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 propagandist, and they also stated directly that now it's a period when the small states do not have to exist. And the world must help us to to finish because, like any other countries, we you know just want to raise kids, to build economy ties, to build any other uh, types of like cultural, educational research with with our neighbors, with the rest of the world. We we did not conquer anyone <laughs> starting from 1991 and even even before. But the empire, the last empire you know in Europe is trying to to become strong and powerful again and uh, this this kinds of excuses they are uses and today uh, Zaharova who is a, um, a speaker of, of the Russian Ministry of foreign, of foreign Affairs she said that Ukrainians did not allow Russians to cook borscht that's why we attacked them what's what's next So you you must understand uh, that it's it's not about Ukraine basically it's it's about uh, future existence of of the whole world it's it's whether the rule of law will will be kept or it will be the rule of those who is big and has nuclear weapon Tatiana thank you <laughs> thank you very much it was uh, a thank you Štai toks pokalbis su Tetiana Borek, ukrainietė, istorikė, šiuo metu gyvenančia Vilniuje ir atliekančia po doktorantūro stažuotė Vilniaus universiteto istorijos fakultete. Dėkodami Tetianai už pokalbį, tik norime priminti mūsų klausytojams, kad remtumėte Ukrainos 
pagalbos Ukrainai iniciatyvas, ar tai būtų Blue Yellow, ar tai ką daro laisvės TV, ar Olego Šurajo fondą, ar visus kitus, kuriais pasitikite. Taip visi kartu prisidėsime prie Ukrainos pergalės. Su jomis buvo kotylį istorikai. Nepamirškite pafalovinti mūsų kanalų, dabar laidos netokios reguliarios, tad tokiu būdu nieko nepraleisite. Iki susiklausimu.